In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I received a very thoughtful letter this morning from a man who comes here on, on occasion and has actually become a good friend. And he commented about the impact that it, it has had on his son since his son became Orthodox. And he said that a lot of the impact, uh, the positive impact on his son's life had been through this monastery. And I was sharing those thoughts with some of the young men that are here today. We have, uh, let's see, I think we have about five young men that have been visiting the monastery this weekend. We're seeing this increasingly, and, and other monasteries of men that I know have been having the same experience. And the women's monasteries are having an influx of young women coming on retreat to those monasteries. Something that, that this man shared with me, which I think is really true, is that and he's much younger than I, but even at his age, he said that he can remember growing up where pretty much everyone identified themselves as Christian. But he said when he was in high school and college that he doesn't really remember actually talking about his faith with his friends. They were, they were just all Christians. That was a given, so they really didn't talk about it. But he said that he's seen something different happening among the young men that are his son's friends, most of them Orthodox, that there's something different happening, that they are actually talking about Christ, and they're talking about the church, and they're talking about their faith. This is a huge difference from the past. And we look at this world. Uh, recently on Mother's Day of all times, there were individuals who rushed into Roman Catholic churches, uh, some of them even desecrating uh, the gifts. There was one church that had their tabernacle stolen, and they found it next to a, a burger joint, broken open, and the consecrated host missing. Who would have ever believed that we would live to see something like this? This is really sim similar to what happened uh, to the Orthodox churches uh, in the Soviet Union. They were attacked and, and, uh, and horrible things happened to both the churches and to the bishops and priests. Desecrations that took place, churches that were imploded, ransacked. And yet in America, we see similar things happening. I have to tell you that I was thrilled when I saw that the Roman Catholic Bishop of San Francisco, Archbishop Corleone, excommunicated Nancy Pelosi. And, uh, and he didn't do it just because, you know, she's an opposition of something. He did it out of his love for her. For some time before that, he had been asking people to send roses to her office in Washington, D.C., along with a prayer that she would repent of her sins and that she would reverse her stand on, on abortion. But of course she didn't. And President Biden is basically claiming, claiming to be a Catholic, and he's done the same thing. He's pro-abortion. And as a Christian, they can't be, especially as Roman Catholics and Orthodox. We, have had teachings of, since the ancient church against abortion. So we look at this with, with, with astonishment. Like, how could we have come to such an age of evilness when we can slaughter the image of God in the womb? We Orthodox know that uh, by our, our teachings that when we are created, the moment of conception in the womb, God, in his infinite love and mercy, bestows upon that fetus the eye of the soul, the noose, 
which will empower that new, about to be given birth to child, the ability to communicate with God. At that moment of conception, when the child has been given that gift of the eye of the soul, the child becomes a child of God. How can we think that it's okay to destroy the life of a child of God? It's murder. It's, it's even worse than murder in many ways. So the fact that there was a, a Roman Catholic Archbishop that was bold enough to, out of love, call this woman to repentance by excommunicating her. Scriptures make it very clear that, that if we receive the very body and blood of Christ, we unworthily we receive it to the damnation of our soul. So Nancy Pelosi's salvation, her eternal life, was at stake. It wasn't about politics. It was about faith. This woman had walked away from a key teaching of her church. And her archbishop did boldly what he, what all bishops should do. Excommunicated her until she repents. Now what does this say about each individual and in how we live our lives? I remember when I was in college, there was a, a history professor asked us to show a hand, our hands, raise your hand if you believe in the devil. Does the devil really exist? There were about 28 students, if I remember right, in that class, and I was the only one who raised his hand. And afterwards, in the student union, I got together with some of my friends who were in that class, and I said, <laughs> you're Christians uh, and I know you believe that the devil is real why didn't you raise your hands and the answer I will never forget it was oh well uh, uh, I didn't want to have my answer affect my grades I was afraid that the professor would, would think less of me if, I, if, he, if he knew that I believed that the devil really exists. And a wonderful thing happened to prove their point was wrong. About three months later, who should walk into the Lutheran church that I was attending at the time when that was that professor and his wife? I was shocked. And I remember going up to him and I said, wow, I'm really surprised to see you. And he said, well, it's because of you. He said, you made me want to know more about your Christian faith because you stood firmly and said, yes, I believe that the devil exists. I believe it. And he said, I knew that most of the students in that classroom believed the same thing, but you were the only one that had boldly stated, I believe it. And you didn't care what your professor thought or what anybody else thought for matter. You said the truth. You know, when we look at our nation and Western world and even the whole of the world, and we think, oh my gosh, what could happen worse? The lies that we've been given and the, the fear engendered about this COVID thing and the need for vaccines and masks and all of this stuff for a disease that only maybe less, a little more than 1% have actually died of. And yet, I live on an island where most people, 96% are vaccinated, and how many of them are still coming down with COVID and passing it around? It's a huge number. People are still wearing masks on this island, even though the mask mandate has been lifted by the state governor. It's, it's, it's sad to me. It's sad to me because people have bought into fear. And as Christians, we, we have no reason to fear. We have no reason to fear at all. 
But we do have reason to be standing bold before the world and declare our faith in Jesus Christ. One of the things, and I shared with some of these young men that are here on retreat this weekend, that uh, many times over the years when I've spoken in area universities, and, and I can actually see almost the eyes of the, of the young students open for the first time when I talk about orthodoxy. Because they didn't know that, that there was a Christianity like that. They had, to, they had walked away from Christianity or never were raised in Christianity because their parents had walked away from Christianity. And all of a sudden, as one young woman told me once, she said, it's sort of like I've heard what, or, what, what Christianity is, biblical Christianity, ancient Christianity, for the very first time in your lecture. Every single one of us who calls herself an Orthodox Christian can be the same voice that I have been in classrooms and tell people the truth of orthodoxy and tell the people and share with the people the impact that Jesus Christ has had on our lives, the transformational changes that have taken place, not only in us, but in those that we associate with because they see in us the light of Christ. That's what we are all charged to be, the light of Christ in the wilderness. This is exciting. This is the one thing that gives hope for all that is wrong and sick and dark in this world of ours. We don't have to walk away thinking, oh my gosh, we're on the world, we're on the brink of horror. And going back to that moment that I said, yes, I believe in the devil, and all we have to do is look at the society around us, and we know that the devil is smiling and that the devil is working hard. But the devil also knows that he doesn't have much time before the second come. And the devil knows that everything that he's doing is really an act of desperation to take away from God what is rightfully God's. It's our own hearts and souls. And so yet we allow ourselves to be distracted by material things about the idea that we want to acquire better jobs, more money, nicer houses, uh, and friends that will recognize in us that, oh, I like him because he has all these things. And yet, if we look closely at what we have within our own community, as Orthodox Christians, this ancient, unchanging faith that empowers anyone that embraces it to live no matter what happens around us. The early church suffered huge numbers of martyrdom. There are stories of people when they found out that their friends or their bishop was being martyred, instead of running in the opposite direction, they ran towards the soldiers and declared themselves a Christian, knowing that they would suffer pain and death. But they did it because they knew that Jesus is in control ultimately, and that what Christ was giving to all of us was the ability to be in communion with the Father, to be the children of God. What more do we want? What more should we hope for? And when we, if we are true to our faith, we know that nothing in this world means anything compared to eternal life. Nothing. Nothing. 
So this is what we are called to do. We are called to be standing boldly before this fallen darkness that has surrounded us. And we must be guardians and defenders of the castle, which is the church. The church is a ship. And when we see lifeboats out there, we want to draw them in to the church. And the way we do that is by making a commitment from this day forward that we will be the light of Christ shining in the darkness. And that darkness will never overcome the light of Christ. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen.